What does it take to see a city touched and a world changed? A people first changed by encountering a loving God. We celebrate because we wholeheartedly believe God deserves to be praised. We connect because we see that true life change happens in the context of meaningful relationships. We care because we believe God loves humanity. Therefore, we exist to reach people that are near to us but far from Him. We are Christian Faith Fellowship Church. Christian Faith family, so glad that you came to join us today, whether that's over Facebook Live, over our podcast, or here on campus. We're just so glad that God has brought you here and that we can worship Him together. We're excited to celebrate Him, to connect with you, and to care for you. Lastly, if you're joining us online, be sure to drop that comment, share on social media. We want to reach as many people as possible, whether that's in our community, our city, the state, nation, or the world, because we know how powerful God is. Thank you for joining us as we reach people who are near to us but far from him. Be blessed. Now you guys ready to hear the word? Raise your Bible and your device in the air. Repeat after me. Say, this is my Bible. This is the living word of God. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. As a result of hearing this word today, my life will never be the same. My life will never be the same. Never, never, never. To the glory of God. And today, we will see miracles. Following this video, we Bishop Jason with the word just for you. In the midst of uncertainty, our faith can struggle. Our walk becomes labored, our heart heavy. There's something about the unknown which seems to weaken us. It drains our patience and blurs our focus. Yet in the middle of everything stands a faithful God a God who's not swayed by the struggle, who isn't moved by the winds of chaos, a God who remains faithful even when our faith is fragile. It seems more difficult than ever to not worry about tomorrow, yet that's exactly what God has asked us to do. For when we cast our burdens on Him, the troubles of the moment begin to fade. When we trust the plans he has for us, our fear begins to subside. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, our focus becomes consumed by clarity. Yes, we are in the midst of uncertainty, but we can be certain of one thing, God is faithful, and that is more than enough for tomorrow. Amen. I go with me in your Bibles to Exodus, the fourth chapter. Exodus, the fourth chapter, the first through the fifth verse and it reads then Moses answered and said but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you so the Lord said back to Moses hey what is that in your hand he said arise and he said being God cast it on the ground 
So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand. I hear you, Father. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. From these five scriptures and something God just dropped in my heart, I want to share with you this message for today, what's entitled, What's in Your Hand? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, come on, say it like you mean it. Say, neighbor, what's in your hand? Now, I see a cheeto on somebody's hand, and I see a bottle on somebody else's hand. Turn to another neighbor and say, neighbor, what's in your hand? So you need to know that you are not an accident or an incident but you are specifically designed by God with purpose and intention. God knew exactly what he was doing, even if the circumstance in which brought you here, they didn't know what they were doing. But God knows exactly what he has planned for your life. You didn't show up here and he was like, oh, I don't know what to do with her, or I don't know what to do with him. I, I didn't prepare anything for them. It, it is quite to the contrary. You are here on purpose because of purpose. Your existence is because God has a purpose for you. There is something that you have to accomplish that can't nobody else accomplish. Many people may look like you, but ain't nobody quite like you. Many people may have the same height as you, but nobody is as tall as you. <clears throat> People may have the same features as you, but nobody is as beautiful as you are. Are you here today? You are unique. You are different. You are created by God for a specific purpose. God has a plan for your life. Put your hand on your chest and say, God <clears throat> has a plan for my life. In most cases, when God shares with us his plan, his desires, his heart. In most cases, we begin to not believe what his plan is. And the reason that we don't believe what his plan is is because we're concerned about what other people may think about that plan. If you look at Moses, Moses says, go back to the scripture, Exodus 4 and 1, Moses said, put it on the side screen too, Moses said, suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Moses had been told by God what to do. Moses' concern was what people thought and felt. And this is the same predicament that we find ourselves in when God tells us to do things that are absolutely unbelievable. When God shares with us our destiny, when God shares with us his plan for our life, they look so counter to where we are that we are afraid to even think it, to speak it, to believe it, let alone to share it, because we are concerned that if we share it with people who are around us, if they don't think like us and believe like us and see like us, they will discourage us. And if they don't believe it, then we will start not believing what they don't believe. Are you still here? But you've got to be in the place where you're saying, this is what God said about me. I'm responsible to God for what he said about me. I'm not responsible about how you feel about it. I'm not responsible about what you think concerning it. But I'm responsible about what he said to me about what I'm supposed to do. God revealed his plan to Moses. When he revealed his plan to Moses, Moses, just like us, expressed to God his doubt and his excuses. If you look throughout the Bible, you'll find people who have encountered God and you'll find their responses to God. God, I'm too short. God, I'm not strong enough. God, I don't speak clearly enough. God, I don't have enough swag. I, you know, they don't say swag, but you know. God, I don't have what it takes to be what it is you call me to be. 
But I want you to know something. God is not looking at your now. He's looking at your, he's not looking at your present. He's looking at the moment of your inception. Because inside of a seed is everything that is needed in order for it to be. What you may be looking at at this moment is a branch. But God saw beyond your branch, saw beyond your trunk, and he saw your fruit. Are you here? So he doesn't speak to what you see. He speaks to what he saw. He saw what it is that he wants you to produce, even though you feel like you can't produce it. Are you here? So we got to stop giving him our excuses about what it is we think we can't do or where we fall short. God told you to open the business, and you're like, well, I don't know it all. That, you, you know what? That's actually perfect. Because when he does in you what he says he's going to do, you can't do anything but say, God did this. And you give him the glory for doing it. When God tells you to move across the country and start a church, and it sounds crazy, and you just do what he says, and you say, well, God, I don't know enough people. I don't know enough this, and how are we going to do this? And you just keep doing what he says. God saw the end when he spoke to you in the beginning. Whatever it is that he told you to do, know that you're capable in him to do it. Let me say it again on this side. Know that you're capable in him to do it. Let me come back on this side. I don't hear nobody. Know that you are capable in him to do it. Because if you were not capable, he would not have asked you to do it. Are you still here? So then what is our response? Again, our response has been excuses. But know this. <clears throat> for our excuse, God has a response for that excuse. <clears throat> Every excuse you give God, God has a response for it. Check it out. So, first verse is Moses saying what his excuses are. Are you with me? Second verse is God responding to his excuse. God responds to his excuse by saying, what's in your hand? The lesson in that quick phrase right there is that we are to be in the place to where we are not giving God our excuses. We're giving him our hand. Whenever God says, I want you to do this and I'm leading you to do this, what he doesn't want from you are your excuses. What he wants from you is your hand. If, if I ask my child, uh, 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 Abigail, come here real quick because you're the smallest of, of, the, of what I have left. <laughs> and, and if I say to Abigail, hey, Abigail, we're going to go over there. And Abigail may say, Dad, I, I, I'm, I'm scared about going over there. I don't know if I can do it. What I want to hear from Abigail now is no more of her excuses because her father said this is where we're going. What I want Abigail as my daughter to do for me as her father is to just give me her hand. Give me your hand. And hand in hand, we'll go to where it is she thinks she can't go. Hand in hand, we can get accomplished what she feels she can't get accomplished. Uh -huh. Hand in hand, we can get it done. So when God says, I want you to do this, when God says, I'm calling you to do this, when God said, I've placed this on your life, when God is saying, I want you to open this, when God is saying, I want you to give all of you to me, don't give him an excuse, just give him your hand. Because if you give him your hand, he'll take you where he said you got to go. Are y'all still with me? Listen. You got to know this. Thank you, sweetheart. God has always used what's in man's hand to bless him. He has always used it. God is not limited by what you do have or don't have. He's not limited by it. God will take what's in your hand, and he will do what he needs to do. Let me give some examples. In the Bible, God used always what a person possessed. In some of the stories, and again, I don't have time to go through all of them, but some of them, God used a stick. And another story, he used a coat. And another story, he used a fish. And another story, he used a couple of pennies to turn a woman's life around. 
And another story, he used a woman who said, I just got a little bit in his pot, in this pot. She, he took that pot, turned it into a business, uh, y'all. He always uses what's in your hand. And another story, he used a boy's slingshot to take down a giant. And another story, he used a jawbone. And another story, he used a rock. And another story, he used five loaves of bread and two fish. God is not limited by what's in your hand. Are you here with me? He's not limited by what's in your hand. But what he is limited is by what you do with your hand. Are you still with me? So what is it we need to do? What is it we need to do? God will always ask us when we give excuses to what he's telling us to do. I want you to stretch out in faith. I want you to believe me for something. Well, God, I don't have enough. God may be telling you it's time to get a house. And you begin to say to God, God, well, I don't know if I have enough of this. God is saying, I'm not measuring what I'm going to do with you by what you measure. I'm measuring what I'm going to do with you by what's in your hand. What are you making available to me? Are you still with me? It doesn't matter what you're facing. It doesn't matter what God has instructed you to do. What matters is your response to him when he says to you, what's in your hand? Are you still with me? So here here are the things we can do when he asks us what's in our hand. And I'm almost finished because I'm using Sunday to set this up and we'll continue it when we come back here on the 27th. What do you do? So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, arise. So the first thing that you have to do and write this down, you have to examine your hand. Examine what you got. Are you here? And stop examining what you got by measuring it to what somebody else got. Because what you got is what you got. You can't change what you got. But apparently what you got is enough for God to use to get you to where he wants you to be. But he can't use it until you first know what you got. So what's in your hand? What, 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 is this, what does this mean, Bishop Jason? What does this mean? What's in my hand? What's in your hand? What is it that you do? What is it that you're good at that can't nobody else do like you? Is it art? Is it music? Is it calligraphy? Is it, is it building something? Is it working with numbers? Is it having a hand that knows how to use it to bring healing to people through comforting them. What is it that you have that's in your hand that nobody else has? If it's in arts, stop letting people who are not artistic tell you that your art won't work. If you, if your artist dance, dance, baby, dance. Y'all got quiet, I'm going to say it again. If your art is dancing, please dance because I can't do it. If your art is singing, sing. If your art is painting, paint. Because what you can do has great value to humanity. Stop letting somebody who doesn't see your value tell you that what you do and what's in your hand doesn't have value. Just because it's not needed to them, just because they don't see the value to them, doesn't mean it's not valuable to the other two point something billion people on the face of the earth at this moment. Stop letting one, well, I'm going to say something. Stop letting one negative person stop you from the dreams that God has expressly told you he wants you to accomplish. Stop letting, oh God, that's good. Stop letting you stop you from the dream. Because sometimes we stop ourselves by disqualifying ourselves by saying we ain't good enough. By saying we made too many mistakes. By saying we have too much baggage or we have too many problems. Hey, let me give you a bulletin. God already considered your issues. 
when he gave you the mandate or the call or the responsibility to do what he put in your hand to do. So you got to look what's in your hand. What do you do well? The pastor, I don't do nothing well. That's a lie from the devil himself. You just haven't discovered it. And it's probably you do it so well that you don't think nothing about it. And it's going to take somebody coming alongside of you saying, man, you do that really well for you to begin to realize that's your thing. There's this guy named Amos that could make chocolate chip cookies really well. That's all he could do. But he killed them chocolate chip cookies. He didn't think nothing of it until somebody came along and said, hey, Amos, these cookies can make you famous. And he became, come on, y'all, famous Amos. Black entrepreneur, stop telling me because of your color. Stop telling me because of your sexual identity. Stop telling me because of the injustices that are in the earth that you can't get ahead. Those are built-in excuses that the enemy has put in the fiber of humanity to stop you from even trying. But we are not limited by what man cannot see and by what man cannot do. If God said it, he can get it done. If God said it, he'll move heaven and earth. If God said it, he'll open every door and close everyone that don't need to be. If God said it, he'll make it happen. You could be black, white, blue, yellow, pink, or purple. If If God said it, he'll make it happen. But you got to look to see what's in your hand. Examine your hand. Stop looking at everybody else's hand. Well, if I had their gift, if I could do what she do, if I could do what he do, man, I'd be be a millionaire. I'd be, listen, look at your own dusty, dirty, need and lotion hand. Maybe that's your thing. You finna create a lotion for dust, you know. Well, it's fine, baby. Whatever your thing is, do that. Are you here? I used to play drums. Key phrase, used to. I remember a while ago, our drummer, Ray, y'all give it up for Ray, Mr. Ray Barwell. And I did that because I know he don't like it. He had to leave to go somewhere. So I was like, cool. I got it. I'll play drums. I used to do it. It's like riding a bicycle. Once you've done it, you should be able to keep doing it. Now, let me help you understand the context of this situation. Playing drums is what I possibly can do. Playing drums for Ray is what he does. He plays he does gigs. He's on records and albums. He just, he does, that's what he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I stepped into what he does with what, my, with what I possibly thought I could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The song came on. We going live. Let's go, Will. Song comes on, and I'm lost. I don't even know what to do. A minute and a half into the song, I just stopped. I put my sticks down and realized this ain't me no more. My area is over here. I'm going to stay in this area right here because this is what I'm born to do. This is what I do. When Ray came back, my wife went to Ray and said, listen, we're glad you had a nice time of rest, but you can't ever leave again on a Sunday morning because I was quite horrible. Because that's not the thing I was created to do. I may can dabble in it, but that's not what's in my hand. What's in Ray's hand is a drumstick. What's in my hand is a microphone. Are you here? But both hands are needed. And one is not more important than the other. Because they're both needed. So please, dear woman and dear man of God, please, those of you that are watching us across the world, look in your own hand and examine what's in your hand. Are you still with me? Next thing you need to do, let's go to the third verse. 
And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Second thing you have to do is once you've examined your hand, now you've got to empty your hand. Once you realize what it is that he has created you to do, and you can do it, and you got it, that recognition was for you to be able to now know what you have to release, what you have to give up. What was in Moses' hand was a shepherd's rod because he was responsible for leading people. It was a shepherd's rod. Human nature is to cling to what we have, even if it seems small and seemingly unimportant. We want to hold on to it. We want to keep it. We don't want to let it go because our mentality is if we lose what's in our hand, then we might not get anything else back ever. So we operate out of this fear. That is human nature. But when you come to God and give your life to God and begin to work by faith, he wants you to exchange your human nature for a God nature. And a God nature is one that's willing to let it go and let God have it. So Moses, you get to choose. You can keep your human nature or you can step into a God nature. And if you step into a God nature, there's something I can do with it. But if you keep it in a human nature, then it's limited by only what you can do. In your hand, a stick is a stick. In your hand, two pennies is two pennies. In your hand, a slingshot is just a slingshot. In your hand, a rock is just a rock. But if you give what's in your hand to God, he'll take the inanimate object. He'll take the thing that you think is no big deal, and he'll use it to get him glory. Sometimes, whoo, sometimes all you got in your hand is a yes. And if a yes is all that you got, then give God your yes. God, I haven't found my gift yet, but I give you my yes. Yes to your way. Yes to your will. Yes to your word. Yes to what you would have me to do. God, I give you my yes. And God will take your yes and begin to take you places and do things because you've given it to him. Listen, God can do more with what's in your hand than you can do with what's in your hand by yourself. Are you still with me? So it brings me to my third and last point. Examine your hand. Empty your hand. Last thing, now enjoy God's hand. Lord, have mercy. After you have emptied your hand and you've given it to God, now you get to enjoy what God's hand is. Watch this. I didn't see this when I studied it, but I saw it. God dropped it in my heart as we were reading this. And he said, cast it on the ground, third verse. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. God will take what's in your hand and turn it into something that is so amazing that it will scare you what he does with it. Oh, my heavens. God is going to bless you so. God's going to turn this situation around so. God is going to breathe on your business so. God is going to breathe on your church so. God is going to breathe on your family so. God's going to do it for you so. He's going to do it so much and so grand that when you see what he does, you'll be scared of what he just did. Because you'll be amazed. My God, God, what did you do with what I gave you? Are you here? Is there anybody in here? I feel like preaching, but I ain't got the I ain't got the energy. Is there anybody in here today that is waiting and willing to be amazed by what God will do and what you give him? Woo, God, I hey, 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 hey. God, I've been holding on to this too long. God, I've been trying to work this all by myself. God, I've been trying to do it with what I know to do. And God, I realize today that I am limited in what I can do. But right now, I've made it up in my mind. I'm going to take everything I got 
take my hand, take my life, take my yes, take my stuff, take everything, and I've given it to you, and I'm going to stand back and be amazed at the miracles you do. Be amazed how you make a way out of no way. Be amazed how you turn that around. Be amazed how you kill the giant. Be amazed how you, woo, how you make all that doesn't stop running. Be amazed at what you do. Are you here today? The Bible is filled with stories of God encountering humanity and God saying to his men and women, what you have is enough with me to see the miraculous happen. But without me, it's not enough to get you through the next day. Are you here? That's why giving is so miraculous. Tithe and offering is so incredible because tithe is taking what's in your hand. Oh, don't you get quiet now. It still applies. Taking what's in your hand that's not enough to get what you need to get done and saying, God, I'm going to empty my hand of what you've asked me to put into your hand, and I'm going to stand back and watch how you take 10%, how you take a tithe, and how you build a house. How do you build a house from a tithe? How do you make new cars from a tithe? How do you create new businesses from a tithe? How do you increase my income from a tithe? I'm just going to stand back in wonder and amazement as you do what you do. Because in my hand, I can't get it done. Who are y'all in here today? Uh, turn to somebody and say, I've got to enjoy God's hand. God took what was in Moses' hand, a rod. The rod in certain places in the story, specifically here, turned to a snake. God told Moses, pick up the snake. When he picked up the miracle, when he put it back in his hand, it turned back to what was in his hand before he released it. So what's the lesson we learn? Out of your hand, it's a miracle. Putting it back in your hand turns it back to what it was before you let it go. Some of us, God is in the midst of working miracles and we get scared by what he's doing. And we go pick up what he hasn't told us to pick up yet. And we stop the amazing and the miraculous process of what he's doing. And instead of you getting this full miracle, you're getting a piece of a miracle because you got scared and it became unfamiliar. Are y'all here today? Whatever God is telling you to do, do it and don't break it until he tells you to do something different. That rod turned to a snake. That snake in other places in the story ate other snakes. That same rod was used to hit a rock and turn rock, make water come out of a rock. That same rod was able to touch water and for a sign to the Egyptians, turn it to blood. That's, y'all don't hear me. That same rod he used in his hand as he told him to use it, and they saw miracles. They saw one thing after another after another. Saying, Pastor Jason, I'm not Moses and I don't have a rod. And I'm saying to you, great, because he's not calling you to be Moses. And he's not calling you to be a rod or to have a rod. Here's what he's calling you to. Go to 1 Corinthians. And I'm done. We'll stay right there because I'm done. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world. Anybody in here feel foolish? Two hands, huh? That's it, huh? Let me try it again. Okay, let me say it differently. Anybody have done foolish things in your past? Okay, I hit it. There you go. I mean, I feel foolish today, but if you think on it long enough, you'll feel like a fool-ish. Are you still with me? God is taking those things. Why? He's taking those things to put to shame the wise because the wise think they got it figured out. The wise have their diagrams. The wise have everything on PowerPoints. The wise has everything figured out. And God said, how I move is not going to be in your box. I'll bring somebody from outside of your box, outside of your sphere, outside of your world to be able to show you I'm not limited 
to your spectrum of education. I'm not limited to your side of the track. I'm not limited to your influences and your connections. I'm God. I'm unlimited. Are you still with me? And God has chosen the weak things of the world. Anybody feel weak? I've chosen those things. He's chosen you. If you feel weak, say that's me. He's chosen you. Uh, he's chosen you to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things. Anybody ever felt low? Say that's me. And God has chosen you and the things which are despised. You ever felt despised? He's chosen you. Why? To bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. He wants your insufficiencies. He wants what you're lacking. He wants what you think isn't enough. He wants your mistakes. He wants all of that. All he wants you to do is that when he comes to you and he says, now's the time. I'm ready for you to walk into your purpose. I'm ready for you to go after what I told you to. And when you give him excuses, remember, give him your hand. Are you still here? Give God your hand. Last thing, I'm, and last thing and I'm done, watch this. And write this down, because it's going to change your life. Your hand leads to the promised land. Your hand leads to the land. God used Moses to bring his people to the brink of the promised land. But they couldn't have got to the land if Moses hadn't first given God his hand. I keep saying, God, where's my land? Where are the things that you have promised me? Where are the things that you say that you're going to do? And he says to you, they are right where I told you they would be. Well, God, how come I'm not there? Why am I not in it? Why am I not possessing it? Why don't I have it? Because there's one thing lacking. What's lacking is not his promise. What's lacking is not his ability. What's lacking is your hand that you're willing to give him your hand. Abigail, come here again. That you're willing to give him your hand. Come here. So right here is you and your hand. And right here is the Father. And over there is the land. Over there is everything that he's promised you that he said he wants to do. But the only way you can get to the land is if you let him lead you by your hand. Because leading you by your hand helps you to know where to go. He knows, oh, no, we're not going to go there because there's something there that's trying to trick you. There's something there that's trying to trip you up. So we're going to go this direction, and then, okay, you still see it? We're going to come this way. No, 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 don't pull your hand away. Stay with me. We're almost there. I know you feel like it's taking too long. I know you feel like your burdens are too heavy. I know you feel like it's just so much on you. I get it. While you are experiencing that, take your other hand, lift your other hand up, and worship him with the other hand, but don't let go of this hand. Because this hand is taking you to the land. Here's everything I promised. Here's everything I said I would do. Here's everything. But you got there because of your what? You got there because of your what? Hand. Thank you. Because your hand, God will take and lead you to the land. I got to stop. Yes. Just what he said he would do. Yes, he's going to what? He's going to fulfill. You are able. God, you're able. In the tough moments, let us remember you're able. 
In the dark moments, let us remember you're able. In the lonely moments, let us remember you're able because we all have to visit those places. But just like the scripture declares, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because, God, you are with me. God, I'm able to get through it because you got my hand. So, God, help us in the situations and the everyday scenarios of life as we're trying to get through from breakfast time to lunch, as we're trying to get through what we're going to put on the table, as we're trying to get through how we're going to pay that bill, as we're trying to get through where we're going to keep a house over our children's head, as we're trying to get through how we're going to get the next pair of shoes because the children are outgrowing them, as we got to get through how we're going to be able to provide for the next moment. God, help us in our desperation to not give up on you, but to keep our hand in your hand. Because you will do exactly what you said. So, God, we thank you for your provision. We thank you for your purpose. We thank you for everything that you have declared and that you have spoken and that you have prophesied concerning us. It will come to pass. We will not give up prematurely. We will not take our lives. We will not end it in suicide because there is great joy and there is great purpose to the days that lie ahead. The days behind us may have been dark, but there is sunshine in the days that lie ahead. Woo! Because you're with me, God. God, you're with us. You're with us. You're with us. And God, I pray right now that if there's somebody that's hearing this, and that they don't know you, whether they are here on this campus or whether they're watching us across the world, that God, right now in this moment, they're stretching out their hand to you. They're stretching out their hand saying, God, I want to be saved. I want to be able to live a life that I can walk with you hand in hand. And God, I thank you that you hear them and that you see them. And right now in this moment, here in this room and across this world, you're coming in and you are grabbing that outstretched hand and you are right now bringing them back where they always belong you're bringing them back home so thank you God for every rededication thank you God for every salvation thank you God for the mystery of your gospel doing what it has done in our hearts today thank you that we're encouraged the evermore Thank you, God, that we realize today we got a new lease on life, that you're not done with us, that we're just getting started, and that greater days are ahead of us. Thank you, God, for doing what only you can do. We give you the praise. We give you the glory, and we give you the honor. In the master's name of Jesus, let all God's people shout hallelujah. Hallelujah favor if you were blessed by that word. Put those hands together and let's thank God for the word that he sent on today. Like it matters. We pray like it matters. And we give like it matters. The word he placed on my heart to give you this week is from Malachi 3.10. And again, we know this. If you've been in church any period of time, you're familiar with it. But he wanted me to revisit it. Bring all. Somebody say all. Come on. Everybody say all. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you, somebody say me the windows of heaven and pour out for you, somebody say me, such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Your lifetime can't hold what God will pour out if you bring it in. I'm going to say it again and you need to write it down. Your lifetime, your expression of years, doesn't have enough capacity to hold the blessing that he will pour out to you 
because you were faithful to bring all the tithe in. Your obedience to bring the tithe in will cause it to be such a blessing that's poured out that your children will be blessed until they figure it out. I'm going to say it again. Your children will be blessed until they figured it out because mom and dad worked it out. Hey! I, I, I feel, I feel, I feel his presence on that. You don't understand the depths of what you're doing when you give, which is why we take it so carelessly. But you've got to begin to shift your understanding that when I give, I give because I know it matters. My kids are blessed because their mama and daddy gives. I'm blessed because my mama gave. My mama was blessed because my grandmama gave. I come from a legacy of givers. Blessed coming in, blessed going out. Blessed in the city, blessed in the field. I'm blessed. Why? Because I'm living in the legacy of the overflow as I provide my own overflow to the next generation. You're not giving because you think it's about something small. With God, it's never something small. With God, it's always something big. But he always starts with what's in your hand. So again, what's in your hand? Will you this week take what's in your hand and bring it to the storehouse or will you take it to Popeye's? Or will you take it to get a new pair of shoes? I'm gonna say this and be done. Our thought for this week is when you bring it in, God pours it out. So if you're not experiencing an out it's because you haven't brought it in. And if you're saying, Pastor Jason, I have brought it in, then what I will say to you is, then just hold on. I hear rain coming. Because God is not a, I gotta stop, but I feel his presence, Aisha. God is not a man that he would lie. He's going to do exactly what he said. Just hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Turn to somebody, touch them if you can, and say, hold on, hold on, hold on. I know it's rough, but hold on. Somebody get out of your seat, find somebody and touch them and say, hold on, hold on. from the work of your hand. Offering is not a percentage. Offering is based upon the conversation you've had with God, whether before you came to church or during your time of worship, where God will move on in you and say, hey, connected with your time, I want you to give this amount of offering. Or the pastor says, there's something we're trying to achieve. Can you help us with that? That's your offering. 
and right now get your time and offering prepared. And I sense to say this, sometimes we, we're learning how to hear him for an amount. And I sense to say this, and if it's not you, don't worry about it. Don't be offended. Just let it go and move on. But I want to challenge someone today that connected to your tithe, you release an offering of $100. If that's you and that resonates with you, then do it. If it doesn't resonate with you, then you get as close to it as you believe that God is telling you to do. On the screens behind me are our various giving platforms. We also have available at the chairs envelopes that if you want to give the a check or cash or credit card, you can on there. But I want your giving to be led by His Spirit. And I want you to know that your giving, it matters. Come on, say that to yourself. My giving matters. Come on, say it again. My giving matters. God is in this place so strong today. As soon as you have your, your time and offering prepared, stand to your feet. As soon as you have your time and offering prepared, stand to your feet. If you're watching us at home, and if you're able to stand, stand where you are. Right now, lift your envelope or your device towards heaven. Father, we thank you for every person that is giving in faith according to your word. Because the words I speak today are not my own, they're yours. It's only an encouragement of what you said. So therefore, God, you are responsible to back up what you said. And God, I thank you that we are giving from the right place. We're giving from a heart of generosity. We're giving from a place of understanding that you'll take what's in our hand and you'll do something amazing. So, Father, I thank you that because of the acts of your people right now, that they won't miss a meal, a bill, or a deal. I thank you right now, God, that collectively everything is received will be used for the work of the ministry to continue preaching of the gospel, that this church will always be able to tell a dying world about a living Christ. And we give you praise for it now. Thank you, God, that once we bring it in, we pour it out. In Jesus' name, let everybody say amen. Precious heart. Wow, what an incredible time. Thank you so much again for joining us here at CFFC. In addition to that, we'd love to further connect with you throughout the week. So if you haven't already, connect with a small group by visiting our website at cffc.org slash small groups. We can't wait to see you this week.